experience in schooling. Yeah. <laughs> but like, no so different. You still. Oh, it's oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, no, no. I totally get it. Uh, got him a rescue dog, and uh, was it? Has it been a year? It was last summer. Yeah, it's last July, so almost a year. And uh, you know, he he's sixty nine. So you know, the older you get, you get set in your ways. And he went to the bathroom. There, she was a puppy. You know what I mean? So it's like they're they, she's just like it's just not strong enough. It's like a kid. Like they have to like kind of like get not happy now it's like the best thing he like is like i love this dog it's like his kid you know what i mean he, he you know is he's old she's set in her ways and we're you know grown people so we're set in our way and it's been kind of a battle of the wills and then you're you're like oh damn dog and then all of a sudden she, she looks at him so yeah, yeah. I, I, I wanted to touch base because uh, you know a big passion of, you know i think for me, it's like exposing people to like what's in the world. You know, I'm like passionate about it because like a lot of people that I grew up with or like my Instagram friends or media friends, like they never even heard of the, like, the Northern Lights, you know? So like I post stuff and people are like, I'm like the Milky Way. And they're like, what is the Milky Way? I'm like, <laughs> don't even ask me that. Um, so I was like, man, like if I could, you know, just ask you a couple interview questions and, uh, you know, just share what I'm going to do is... Uh, Pop this on my YouTube. I'm gonna post it to my Facebook. I'll probably wait like a week or two. Like I said, things will die down some more. Um, <laughs> and then uh, talk, talk, talk more about Pebble Mine towards the end. You know what I mean? So like, I, I just feel like uh, kind of like my heart is drawn to like have people like start exploring the outdoors more. People that you know may have not thought about it or you know been exposed to it. You know? Yeah. So sure. my my first question is like, what? Well, go ahead. Should... Go go go. <laughs> If you want me to switch it to a horizontal uh, camera orientation for, uh, if you can, like, if not, no worries. Let me just see what I can do here. Oh man, no one, no one that light. Yeah, there you go. Look at that. Oh man, we're so fancy. Now. That's how you can tell you're a professional. <laughs> Dude, this is all. This is all stuff. This is all stuff. Yeah. Dude, that's perfect. <laughs> Like, before all this Pebble stuff, like, I didn't know, you know, I might have taken a selfie or two, but it's not like I was, like, paying attention to what, you know, orientation my camera was or anything. And now, get this, I got this this girl that, uh, she wants to make us a TikTok, which I know nothing about TikTok. Like, absolutely nothing. Dude, I don't even know it. Like, I, like, tried it once, and I was like, this is, this is like, you know, you reach a point in life, I'm like, this is, like, beyond me. So I like, just gave it up. <laughs> well, it made sense. Like she's like, "Yeah, this is this is what kids are." And if we want to reach a different, uh, maybe we need to talk about getting you a TikTok channel for. <laughs> well, you know, then she said it's not a TikTok. It's not a TikTok channel. It's just a TikTok. It's just a TikTok. No, but dude, honestly, I mean, you get yourself on TikTok. That is like revolutionary. That is like like the entire generation of like. <laughs> Like, you know what I mean? It's just like, you know, I don't know. Yeah, that would be, like, amazing. So you have someone that's going to do it for you? It's influ influencing the music sales. Because, like, if you can get your song to go viral on TikTok, it is now, by default, like, the number one song oh. kind of thing. So now, like, artists, musicians are thinking... Again, I'm, I just read something. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not an expert, but it makes perfect sense that if, if 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 it gets to be one of those songs that kids are doing the dance to on TikTok, oh, forget about it. You're made, yeah. Right. Dude, so now we just need to figure out how bears to dance on TikTok. <laughs> I <don't> know. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's cool. set up. Uh, yeah, man. Oh, I'm, I, no, I, I, it's a joke, but I really think that you should go forward with it. You know what I mean? It just have to be like creative. Like the thing is like the attention span is short. You know what I mean? Like it have to be like, I don't even know what, it, you know, but I, I think that it will work, you know? Right. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I've got people for that now. That's where that's right. You I have know. someone that's that's their lane. That's what you have to do. Because I, like, I, I get to, I don't know anything. I don't know. Anything. I tried it and I was like, this is like, mm -mm. so. <laughs> My first question is like, uh, you know, what inspired you to get involved with the outdoors or like what was like was like a magical moment for me? You know, my uncle took me bass fishing in Vermont when I was like 12 and that was like 
that like kind of like sparked my interest and I kind of forgot about it like while I was a teenager but then like as a young adult it was like I just exploded with like fishing bears Alaska you know canoeing everything so what what, what about you well you know for me so when I was a kid I grew up in Iowa I was born in Alaska I grew up in Iowa and I was in Boy Scout and we camp and Learn to fish, you know, catching heads off grandma's pancakes for bait. And, uh, and I mean, that was all intriguing to me, but it was incorporated into my life to, it was a, just enough thing that we did. Like, mm. we would go fish and I enjoyed it, but it wasn't, uh, it didn't spark like a calling. Like, I need to, I need to do more of this. It was just part of our, our normal summer routine. Right. Kind of. And then, when I came to, when I came back to Alaska in 99 and I witnessed kind of the, the scale of the wilderness and like the bears, the the wildlife in general, moose, like just all these mind blowing things that, that are really intact and big. Like if everything is just on a scale that is, is hard to comprehend. And so while, you know, I was five years old and running around the woods in Minnesota, it was still this little world. And once I figured out how wilderness and wildlife and things like that fit into the bigger scale, uh, I really, I got sent out to a, a bear viewing camp in Lake Clark National Park. And that was just like, dang, that's, this is, this is, I need to be in more places like this. And then I spent the last 20 years just trying to figure out how to get to more places like that. I was just out there the other day. It was great. I went back. Uh, oh, dude, that's so oh, cool, man. And, and then I just did that for 20, 20 years, kind of, well, kind of bouncing around and getting these different wilderness experiences. I was a fishing guide for a while and, you know, bear viewing trips and then photography. And, and then I realized that, you know, per, per, specifically through this Pebble Mine fight that, like, these things that are so amazing and need to be shared with everybody. Uh, there, there are people out there that don't value them in the same way. And if you want that opportunity, if you want to protect them, you gotta, you gotta fight. <laughs> so yeah. that's when clubs came off on the, on the pebble ordeal. Yeah, for sure, man. You know, I think that it's, it's similar for me in that like, people need to experience these things, you know what I mean? And, 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 and if we don't fight for it and we don't share these stories, then they'll be gone and people, you know, they will never get a chance one because they've never been exposed to it. And before they get a chance to, it'll be gone because no one protected it. So I'm, I'm like right in line with like what you, you know, I'm like very passionate about. I think it's one of those things too, where like I'm seeing in my life where like, it's something that I'm like, all right, I'm working and I'm teaching, but like, all of those things are for me to like get to being a conservationist. You know what I mean? Like creating more time and more opportunities. Like all my friends are like, all right, what's the next thing we're doing? Like I like went on a, a canoe trip, uh, you know, a day before my birthday. They're like, all right, all right, what are we going to do? You said we're going to go see the Milky Way in July, right? The new moon. We're going to go up to the Catskills. We're going to sleep on the mountain and see, you know, so like my friends are starting to get excited about just getting outside and seeing things, you know? So uh, my next question is like, uh, I know you, I know, you know, I, I messaged you, you helped me out with the bears and you set me up with McNeil. Um, but like, what do you do in the winter time? Like what happens when the bears go in hibernation and you, and uh, they're, you know, they're sleeping for the winter. What do you do? Well, so the, uh, the bear viewing does drop way off when those bears are in their dens. Like it's, it's not good light for photography in there. It's just maybe not a good idea to even go in. So we just don't do it. Um, but so my, my brown bear season in Alaska runs into September usually. And then um, usually like early October, I'll head over to Canada and I work with a buddy there to do polar bear trips. So it's, it's kind of similar to our Alaska brown bear tours, but we're, we're actually driving around in little SUVs and stuff like that. And, um, so we take people and it's just short with like a month basically that on the on the shores of hudson bay you know polar bears just like sea ice but sea ice isn't what it used to be and so they'll congregate shores and they just that sea ice 
And as soon as, you know, the best day of polar bear viewing is the day before the bay freezes, but nobody knows when that's going to be. So you're just kind of... It's like a crapshoot. Yeah. yeah. And then it, it's pretty amazing how fast, like once that bay freezes and can support the bears, within a couple of days, they're just, they're out there. Because they, you know, they haven't eaten a seal and I mean, they might've gotten lucky or they might've found a, you know, whale wash up or something like that, but they're, they're gone. They're out there. And so that goes until like mid November, we'll call it. And then, uh, then I take a little time because <laughs> the summer, I mean, this summer is weird with pandemics and whatnot, but, um, like normally the summers are just go, 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 go. And then it rolled. And then I have a little window for fishing, right. Between, uh, uh brown bear season and polar bear season. And then, I used to do Aurora tours in Churchill and I do want to get back into that uh, cause that's just amazing. And that's usually like January through March. And then uh, in like the last couple of years, last three years, I think I've gone down to Mexico for three weeks to do the, the monarch butterfly migration, which is something I think a lot of people don't even know about, but basically all of the monarch butterflies that you might see, you know, in Vermont, in New Jersey, or wherever they are, like all the way from to like southern Ontario is the extent of the range. All the monarch butterflies from east of the Mississippi fly to basically this one little region in Mexico. So you're walking through the trees, this big old forest with huge trees, and and they're just covered with butterflies. Like it's like being in a snow globe of butter. You look at a tree, you can't see the tree because there's so many butterflies on it. <laughs> excuse me but I, I and i know it's a far cry from the bears so if somebody's been out bear viewing with me it's weird that i'm into butterflies too but it started when i was a kid you know in fourth grade we raised monarch butterflies and you know released them and went through the whole process milkweed and, and all that and it it stuck with me to the point that when this opportunity to go down there popped up i was like heck yeah <laughs> sign me up for that and now i've made some good friends down there so i really look forward to going down hanging out eating some avocados eating, eating all the fresh food that we don't yeah. get in alaska seriously <laughs> my mind, I, all, I can't even wrap my mind around that that all the monarch butterflies like migrate south that i can't even conceive that so i, I it's something that i will be excited to experience one day <laughs> that's like <laughs> What um so if could you backtrack a little bit and talk if you don't mind about the northern lights thing you said that well, I, so here's the thing here's my understanding of the northern lights I know what they are I know that they're always there but I guess I guess the weather doesn't always present itself like the Milky Way when it's cloudy to be able to see the Milky Way so like why is it that this place where you go or used to do the guiding why is that uh, I guess better than other places and in that time of year. I guess, why is it better during that time of year to like see uh, the Northern Lights? Well, so the reason that the Aurora is good in specific places has to do with the magnetic fields of planet Earth. And so the magnetic field is basically attracting these charged particles that have been flung off the sun and they hit the Earth in very specific patterns based on the forces, the magnetic forces. And so it's actually a ring or a, an oval that is set on the magnetic pole. And so if you are looking for places to go see Aurora, you want to cross-reference your Aurora oval map. And there, there are a lot of data out there. That, I mean, it's, it's easy to find this stuff. University of Alaska Fairbanks Geophysical Institute has web pages and web pages and web pages based on it. But it basically starts in like uh, – you know, the good place would be like Tromsø, Norway, uh, Iceland, uh, southern Greenland, Churchill, Manitoba is kind of the southern extent of it, but because it, it's centered on the magnetic pole, not the geographic pole, so it dips down south there, and it goes up through like Yellowknife, and then like just north of Fairbanks, Alaska, I usually think of it as like Coldfoot or Wiseman, somewhere uh, right in there, and so then you cross-reference that with just like you were saying, it's, it's, it's atmospheric conditions that, that let you see through to Aurora. So you have to look and see which ones have the highest number of clear skies. Uh, if you just want to see. So you want some place that's really cold because places that are cold, you don't have a lot of moisture in the air. So you have fewer clouds. 
So you look at places like uh, Churchill, Manitoba, um, you know, a lot of the Aurora tours to Churchill, they were three or four days people got to look for Aurora. And I went one time, I think I went 17 straight nights with seeing the Aurora and then, uh, and then Yellowknife is a good one. And then Fairbanks is really good. It's, it's accessible. So not just Aurora, like if you're talking for photographic purposes, but you've got reflections of the Aurora in the water, but there are more clouds. So you have to go for longer to ensure that you get an Aurora show. And then the whole thing goes on these kind of 27 day cycles. And then you also need to be aware of ambient light. You know, just like looking for the Milky Way, you're not going right. to see it from it's Manhattan. Like, right. And if you're next to the city, forget about it. <laughs> yeah. So the moon, the moon, the Aurora, um, though they're they're huge and impressive or have the potential to be, um, they're not as bright as you might think so that they can be overshadowed by a full moon. So mm. for photographic purposes, I like to have them. I like to be in the like bottom quarter or bottom half of the, the moon phase. Um <laughs> then another tricky thing for viewing, if you go when it's absolutely dark, it's really hard to walk around. You end up running into stuff and falling over. So it's nice to have a little moon so you're not running into doors and stuff. So you know, given that, all that information, everybody's got to kind of run their own equations and see and figure out uh, what's best. You know, what you, you just want. You know, it's, it's pretty easy. Uh, you pick one of those places that's clear and dark and cold. Um, pick it in the, the new moon end of the, the moon phase and boom, just go hang out and uh, drink coffee, stay up late, stay sleep late. all day. Yeah. It really messes with the sleep cycle. Wow. That's cool, man. It's definitely on my bucket list. I, have, I haven't, haven't uh, seen them yet. I have friends who have like tried and failed actually. They like went to uh, uh, Iceland, I think too. And then they, they just when they were there, it just didn't pop up. The conditions weren't right. And they, you know, they spent whatever amount of money were there for five or six days and then, you know, kind of like struck out. So, wow. Well, it's getting easier because there are apps on your phone that'll give you an alert. Like they know, they know where you are. Your phone knows where you are. They GPS track you or whatever. And so if the Aurora is going to turn up in your neck of the woods, I'll alert you. If, if you a text alert and say, hey, go outside and look north or whatever, um, but it's, <clears throat> since it's coming, you have varying rates of, uh, material coming off the sun. So if you've got what's called a solar storm or a coronal mass ejection, a CME, uh, if you want to get nerdy with it, right. uh, it, it will, uh, it'll, it'll broaden the band where you can see it. So it's, it's the KP index it's called, which is basically a function of how far south you can see the aurora. So if you're in Churchill or Yellowknife or uh, Coldfoot, you might only need a KP index of two. Actually, one of the best shows I've ever seen was a KP2. Um, but if it's a KP7 or six or seven, like you can see it just north of Seattle. Whoa. Like, I mean, it, and the biggest wow. solar storm that I've been able to records for was in, oh shoot, now it's, the year is escaping me. I have, I'm not in Aurora brain mode. I'd have to look it up. But, yeah, no um, but Puerto Rico one time. Yeah, the solar storm was so big that – and Puerto Rico is at like 20 degrees north latitude. So you have to theorize that you could see pretty much around the whole globe. Wow. Man, that is cool. Um, I want to touch back real quick on the polar bears. I mean, I know what the difference between a polar bear and a, and a grizzly or a brown bear is, but what, what's the difference in the in the actual bear viewing? Like, I know when I was in Alaska, you know, at McNeil, everything I did was like by foot. You know, <laughs> and, and I guess bears can be aggressive, but it seems as though their their behavior was very predictable. Um, but like, what's the difference between like the, your brown bear viewing and then like your polar bear viewing? Well, so. The brown bear viewing, like you said, it's very – here in Alaska anyway, and of course this is something – you know, don't try what we do in Alaska and Yellowstone. Or we're, we're just – for all for all the viewers, um, not, all, not all bears are created equal, and the ones we have here in the coastal regions of Alaska are generally uh, – <clears throat> I don't necessarily think of them as, as aggressive, but I think of them as uh, more tolerant. Mm. So like bears, it's all about – 
how tolerant they are. And, and it has to do with their experience with humans. It has to do with uh, uh, how much food is available. You know, here on the on the coast in Alaska, the lunch swims right to them. Like they're not having to defend a home range or, you know, chase down ground squirrels or what. Um, with polar bears, there's less <clears throat> working knowledge, we'll call it, on, on on-the-ground polar bear experiences, which is what we go to Churchill, Manitoba, which is, you know, it's right on Hudson Bay, and we drive around the back roads on in, like, Toyota 4Runners and, you know, SUVs, and then... <clears throat> back in the vehicle right you know you're in the next to the vehicle you get out you take your pictures the bear starts walking towards you at a certain point i as the guy determine you know what we just don't want to be in this situation and which one just don't want to be in but you got to spot soon enough to know when to just just get back in the truck, in the truck. <laughs> basically yeah. and so i don't necessarily think they're very curious and when we watch bears here in Alaska during the summer, whether they're fishing or grazing, we are seeing these bears. They are business oriented at this point where they, uh, you know, they, they're they doing their feeding for the year. Whereas you go see polar bears in Churchill and they're bored out of their minds. Oh. Like they've been waiting since July. Nice. And they are just, they're walking around. They're like, and, you know, even if it's, even if it's 32 degrees, even if it's freezing, in Churchill, that's still too warm for a polar bear. Like these polar bears want it like 20, 30 below, like at 30 above, it's like they're wearing, they're, they're, they're wearing their park in the summertime to them. Cause they are so just absolute cold, cold, cold that once the temperature starts to drop, you see them, Oh, they're more active. They start walking around. They, they might start playing cause they're bored. You know, people you read in these books and, People tell you even that say, oh, the polar bears that spar near Churchill, they're trying to size each other up so that when they get out on the ice for mating season, they know who not to mess with. But like I'll tell you, from my understanding of how bears think, that's that's a byproduct, not a cause. Mm. Like those bears are bored and they see the same bears year after year after year and they get to the point where they're like, oh, it's so-and-so. And they, they have a not necessarily a bond, but they have a, a trust relationship with that bear, that other bear that allows them to maybe let their guard down a little bit and say, okay, let's, let's wrestle <laughs> basically. And it's, it's fun to watch. It's these bears interacting. It's, and I don't know, the first time people see polar bears, it blows their mind. Cause I mean, it's something you've seen on TV, but nothing bears you to being, you know, on the edge of a freezing ocean with, you know, blowing north wind and then i'll be damned if here doesn't come a polar bear just like it's supposed to and you know it, and everybody reacts different i've had people break down and cry wow. i've had people get scared i've had people uh, and everything in between basically everybody's reacting to these things differently um but when it comes to like conservation it, it just kind of speaks to how everybody has their own reasons why something should be conserved and so, like, for, for, for me, you know, I love these things, but I'm also deriving economic benefit from them. So, like, I have multiple reasons to not just love – I'm not necessarily just doing this for the, you know, conservation projects for the love of the bears. In some ways, I'm, I'm also fighting for my own Livelihood. economic opportunities. I got, a, I got a mortgage to pay. <laughs> Yeah, seriously. Uh, I have a, a, a fanboy question. It's not your photo, but I, I don't even know if it's real, but I'm going to ask it. Uh, so there's a photo. This is particularly uh, in relation to polar bears. There's a photo where a photographer is, uh, he uh, he's not taking the photo. He's standing behind a tripod and there's a bear cub on his foot and he has his hand out and he's like, it looks like he's either feeding or like has his hand out reaching to like, I guess what's a mama polar bear. Is that real or is that fake? Have you seen it? Do you know what I'm talking about? Is it garbage? Let me know. I do talking about, and I don't, I don't know. All right, cool. (laughs) I don't know, but like it goes back to, you know, every, every bear interaction is different. Mm -hmm. And of course I don't endorse eating polar bears. Yes. Like out on the, out on the ice, like some of those, you know, it's a, I think it's a black and white photo. It is. It is. Right. 
and like in the day when people were were uh, out there doing the first kind of forays into scientific research, like it could have been a, a, a polar bear mom that they drugged or something like that because they won't drug the cubs are just running around all mom's drug maybe she's coming too maybe you know there are any number of scenarios where that yeah uh, could have happened safely but then it's back in the day when you know they were figuring stuff out so it could have just been pure recklessness and good luck that that guy survived <laughs> you know and there's what you worry about is 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 not necessarily you getting out of the situation which is important but how is that bear going to interact with the next person where they say oh well you know, that dude gave me a sandwich. What is this dude going to give me? <laughs> kind of thing. And that's when bears get shot. But who knows, who knows? But I have seen that picture, and it does make for a good uh, a good meme. I've seen it go around <laughs> yeah. the internet a couple of times. I was like, man, I could have asked him that. I was like, I, and I, I, it wasn't even on my list of questions, but I just thought about it, and I was like, maybe he knows. But um, – <laughs> My my last question, I have two kind of like two last, my, my last question is like for people who want to, I guess, get active, you know, is this thing like in Pebble Mine, like I have a son, I want him to be able to come to Alaska with me in a few years. But like the, the Pebble Mine is like, it's like, you know, it's messing things up and, the, you know, the potential for it. But like, how can the regular person like myself who cares, how can we like uh, get involved in the fight and, uh, you know, just stay active? You know what I mean? Well, so right now we're kind of in a, I'm not necessarily going to call it a holding pattern, but we're waiting for the government to release their uh, environmental impact statement. And so the thing right now to do is raise awareness. And that'll be for the next couple of weeks here. And then once they release this uh, environmental impact statement, which all signs, you know, there have been some documents released and everything on their website based has been ignored. All of the input from uh, cooperating agencies, Fish and Wildlife Service, BLM, you know, all these government aid to tribes, um, the native voices in the area have all been ignored. And so the other trick that they're pulling, and, well, and it's it, this is this whole process has really opened my eyes to just how corrupt this whole process is, is so we've all commented on this Southern route and then 90% of the way through the process is the comments were already submitted. They changed the plan significantly. They said, we're not going to go there. We're going to go to the north and do this completely different rant that nobody commented on. Like, I was talking to somebody who was part of a commenting process for one of the government agencies, and they said, yeah, we didn't even look at that route because – they had shortened the comment time that the government had basically said, you have two weeks to comment on. So of course you're going to comment on the route that they said they wanted to use, right? You're not going to devote all that time and energy and resources to this route that they said they don't even want. And so they're, they're not extending the public comment period. They're not extending courtesy to tribes to comment further on this change in route. And it's, it's scary. And then they're going to, going to release this thing and so now the tricky part is how do we activate our members of congress on a federal level to exert their power you know this is trying to exert power once removed like if, if your legislator's doing something that ticks you off you can call them up and write them a letter like directly but right. now we're trying those legislators to influence the army corps of engineers so as soon as this thing drops, we're going to read it and we're going to do a quick analysis to see where it's deficient. And then we need to go to our federal representatives and say, um, look, you need to use your power, which by extension is our power to stop this because one, they're ignoring science two, they're ignoring the public three. This whole process is just seriously, seriously shady. It's happening during that. Uh, a time of huge upheaval. Um, you know, the, the whole, these discussions about the police brutality that are going on, this is the time we need to be focusing on that. We need to be focusing on staying healthy during a pandemic. Right. Like, so there's these two and, major things going on, right? And it's like back door. All the, and they're trying, while, while, while we're talking about how to keep our friends and family safe, they're talking about how to line their own pockets while everybody else is looking away. And that's what it boils down to. And so it's, it's going to be a, a letter writing campaign uh, where, or frankly, 
you know, a lot of people don't contact their legislators. And it's one of those things where your legislators, they're in Washington, D.C. or wherever they are. Um, they don't know you're mad until you tell them. Mm. So you got to call them, got to write letters and things like that. And then ultimately, it's going to be about voting. It's going to be about voting your conscience and saying, hey, this this needs to stop. We need to uh, we need to make a change at the top. And because frankly, this um, this Pebble Mine project under the Obama administration went away. Like it was beat. It was done. Like this, the only reason you're fighting this fight is because Donald Trump is in office. Mm. It was his administration that resurrected it and fast tracked it, and they are trying to get it rammed through before he leaves office. Oh God, it's terrible. <laughs> it's 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 a, it's eye opening in terms of of the consequence of of not voting or not doing your due diligence on who you vote for. Um, it's 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 time to yeah. take it back. Right. Let's take it back. for sure. What, I mean, I know you talked about this a little bit, but what, I mean, do you, do you have an idea? What's the like financial implications of this happening? I know in your specific lane, you do bear viewing and that in the past 20 years has probably blown up in terms of popularity. Um, but like, what else? Like, I know there's like fish, I know you have villages, you have fishermen, like, does anyone even, has anyone ever tried to quantify like the, the economic impact of the pebble mine? Like to some extent, um, you know, we look at the, the the fishery that this threatens. So here you've got this this the, well, and one thing is lost in this is the scale of this whole project. Like this would be the biggest open pit mine in the world, and digging the hole in that part of the world just creates sulfuric acid that would have to be maintained forever. If you took all the mines that already exist in Alaska and you put them all in one place, this mine would be eight times larger than and. Uh, and so, like, when you're trying to quantify, thing one, you need to quantify that. But when you're looking at the impacts, um, you look at the, uh, the threat to the fishery. So if you have this toxic sulfuric acid or copper or dust, my, uh, what's it called, fugitive dust, um, getting it and, and whittling away at this Bristol Bay sockeye fishery or some catastrophic dam failure that wipes out the fishery, that, ge- that fishery, if you just leave it alone, generates about $1.5 billion a year. And about 14,000 jobs. And then you look at the uh, history of the peoples out in that part of the world that have been living there for 10,000 years. Yeah. Like it's, 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 it's hard to put because so many things boil down to dollars and cents these days, but it is, is hard to put a value, a, a monetary value on um, culture on traditional values, on traditional lifestyles. And, you know, this goes back to, you know, preserving things for future generations. Um, you know, you want to be able to take pet fishing out in, in Bristol Bay. You yeah, yeah. want to share that generation that this project would gravely jeopardize your opportunities to do that. Wow. Man, thank you. I have one last question. I'm going to wrap it up because I'm about to cook some chicken on the grill for my wife. (laughs) Um, My last, if you could just recount for me, I want to end on a positive note. Um, One of the things that that kind of motivated me, I was at a bar with a friend who whose husband lived in Alaska or grew up in Alaska. And he was like, oh, I was like, I want to go see bears. He was like, you got to go to McNeil. So I like (laughs) typed up Alaska bears on YouTube and I saw your video and I was like, what where like where does one go to do this and how do i sign up so like what like i know you guys name bears not to uh you know not to like maybe make an a a love attachment to them but just to identify them but what was that video it's like world famous on youtube like what happened that day like you were you were a guide at mcneil during that time and like i don't know if you could just tell me about it well, what's funny, and you've been to McNeil, so you know the the, the context in which all that went down. But yeah, hundred percent. It's a, just for people who haven't seen it. It's a bear, a, you know, about a thousand pound male brown bear, grizzly bear, that walks up and sits next to me, and then kind of sits down, 
and then he's looking out at the river and then he just he's trying to figure out his route to get down into the river and he loops back behind and i have to kind of shield him off a little bit but that bear you know you think about it from his perspective he had just woken up from a nap and he's you know he's probably 20 years old in that video so every day that he'd come to that exact spot to go fishing there had been a small group of well-behaved humans doing just what we were doing there and so he's perfectly comfortable because you know our our behavior was predictable so it's something that he does frequently like that's just that was like a normal wednesday for him <laughs> <laughs> and that was the one I, I happened to record and when I was going through, well, what was going through my head as I was recording it was, it was, I was not scared or anything because it was normal. Like that's when you're in that moment at, in that spot, it makes perfect sense. And, um, going through my head, <laughs> I was actually thinking, uh, so our mutual friend, John Hechtel. Uh, John, loves, my yay. I love John. Yeah. And I was thinking, oh man, John's going to be so jealous. And so I recorded <laughs> it. And I put it on Facebook and somebody ripped it off my Facebook page and put it on YouTube. And that's when it went viral. Like I had nothing. It was just on my normal, like it was a lesson in, in social media and how oh, things get out of hand. Man. And, and, uh, and that's when it went viral. And I'm in a field camp, so I have no idea what's going on. Oh. Like I, I, for weeks and then I get back and I like I talked to my mom. She's like, people have been calling my boss at Fish and Game was like, Yeah, we got a call NBC. Like, I don't know. I can't talk on the phone. It's a satellite phone. I can't don't tell them tell them I'll I'll talk to them in August when I get out of here. <laughs> so <laughs> but now it's a fond memory and you you look at you look at the people that have discovered McNeil River through that video. Um, like I would put you in that category. Like that was your introduction to, uh, McNeil river. And it, it really, like our friendships come from that. Like so many things, good things have come from, Great. from that video. Bears. It's just another, another good thing that comes from watching bears. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, to circle back, man, to my passion, I actually get chills thinking about it. It's like, like that video really kind of morphed me into like, I have a responsibility to expose my family, my friends, people I love, and people I don't even know on my social media to say, you know, let's try this, let's go out. Because, you know, every time I go on a canoe trip or see the stars, it's like this magical experience. And I'm like, people need to experience and see these things before they leave this earth. You know what I mean? It's just something about it. I can't explain it. But I'm like, I I'm selfish, but I can't keep this to myself. I have to share it with the world. Um, so, man, I don't know. Thank you for uh, taking the time to chat with me. Um, I really, really, really appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, cut, the, put this on my YouTube and maybe make an audio, some audio clips. And I'm going to share on my social media uh, platforms. And uh, yeah, just do my part, man. If you, you know, any, any other help you need, let me know. But I appreciate it so much, Drew. Right on. Well, stay tuned because we we have gone out this time. It's weird because of the pandemic and small planes and all that, but we did fly out and, and do a little webisode that's going to be dropping here in the next couple of days. So I'll send you some advanced uh, advanced footage just uh, just so you can check it out. And then when the time comes, you can push it around the internet. Yeah. Oh, dude, 100%, man. 100%, man. I appreciate it so much. But I'm going to uh, I'm gonna get to the grill so my wife doesn't stab me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, it was good talking to you. We'll talk again soon. All right, Drew. Have a good day, bud. See you later. See ya.